announcements and the reading of scripture and prayer and singing and all of the things that we have in our worship service. But there's something that's relatively unique in the village churches in the Philippines. During the offering, I was struck by the types of offerings that people bring and, and give to the temple of God, give to the church of God. Usually at the front of the churches in the Philippines, they have a table and they don't hand the plate around, but they have a box or a plate on the table. And during the offertory, people will come forward and they will place their money into a bag or into a box. But when you're in the villages, what's striking is sometimes you'll see somebody walk up with a, with a small bag of rice and place it on the table. Or somebody might come up with some vegetables and place them on the table. Or somebody might even have a piece of meat and they'll place it on the table. And the rice and the vegetables and the meat are for the pastor and for his family so that they will have food to eat that week because the village churches are generally quite poor. And then whatever small offering there might be, a good portion of that would go to the maintenance of their pastor and uh, the rest for just the general things that they have to take care of. But uh, I thought to myself, that's, that's a small offering, isn't it? I mean, one small little baggie of rice is maybe enough rice to feed two or three people for one meal, possibly two, depending on how much rice that you eat. And so it's a small sacrifice. But for some people, a bag of rice is a large sacrifice. It requires an intentional choice. It requires them to go into their own small rice reserves and cut some out of that to bring it to offer it as a sacrifice to God. And it's a worthy sacrifice. And it is a sacrifice that is worthy of eternal reward. Somebody who brings a small handful of vegetables and offers it as a sacrifice to God. It's a worthy sacrifice. It's pleasing to God. And it is worthy of eternal reward. You see, it's not the amount that someone gives that is really significant. There are those who will give a bag of rice to the church every week who will receive a greater reward than those who might give $1,000 a week to the church. Because God knows the heart. God knows the motive. God knows the reason why you're giving. God knows how much of a sacrifice that it is. And for some people, a small bag of rice is a greater sacrifice for them than for a rich man who might give $10,000 to the work of the Lord. Jesus was a people watcher. Have you ever noticed that? He loved to watch people. And in our text here this morning, we see that Jesus is sitting at the temple, and what's he doing? He's watching people give their offerings to the temple. He is sitting next to the treasury, and he's just observing all the people as they come by, putting their coins into the chest in the treasury. Now, the treasury, of course, is something very different than what we might imagine in our own minds today. The treasury is not like the box that we have at the back of the auditorium here or the offering plate that is handed around. The treasury was something much more significant than that. In fact, in the ancient world, when you had a larger city, the, the, the architects would often design and have built a special building in the city that was considered the treasury. And people would bring their offerings and their gifts to this specific building. And, and, and it was often the target of, of raiders and robbers because they knew that the wealth of the city was often housed in that particular building. It was the treasury house. It was the, the bank of the community. And, and, and often in these treasury houses, you would also house all of the, the spears and the shields and the armor of your enemies that you've defeated. It would almost be like a museum. As you walk around, you can see the greatness and the glory of that particular city uh, just by going into this temple that's specifically designed uh, for, for these things. So Jesus is, is next to the treasury. And, and although the temple in Jerusalem is not exactly what I've described there, it was a financial hub in Jerusalem and in, 
in, this, in the nation of Israel. And as Jesus sat there, there was more than just one little box. In fact, there, were, there would have been 13 trumpet-shaped containers that would have been placed at different spots around the temple. And each of these trumpet-shaped containers were for specific types of offerings. Some of them were for just general offering, but others were for specific offerings. So as Jesus sat with his disciples outside the treasury, he would have seen a box or many large boxes in the shape of trumpets, and he was watching people put their money into these treasury boxes. I imagine that many of the scribes and the Pharisees would come up to one of these treasure boxes and they would make sure that they arrived at the time when the most people would be gathering at the temple. And you can picture the scribes coming with their large sums of money and, and standing at the box, knowing that if they dropped large coins into the box, that the box would, would rattle with the, with the weight of their coins. And you can picture a scribe walking up, taking one coin at a time, one gold coin or a silver coin or even a, a good-sized copper coin, and just dropping them one at a time, you know, clunk. He pauses, another one, clunk. And, and then another one into the box, you know, clang. And, and all the people, because he made sure there were lots of people around, were listening to the money dropping into this trumpet-shaped box, thinking to themselves, did you hear? Saying to their friends, did you hear you know, the, the weight of that money? Did, did you hear how much that man was putting into the box? What a generous man. What a, what a godly man. What a sacrificial man. Look at, look at the gold. Look at the silver. Look at the amount of money he's dumping into the box. You can picture the scribe listening to the whispering, delighting in the whispering, and then when he finishes putting his money into the box, he walks away with his head held high, with his chest just stuck out with, with great pride over what he's done. And the whispering words of the people were just caressing his proud heart. That's what was happening here. That's what Jesus was watching. At least some of these men were coming and they were scribes and they were very much interested in hearing people whisper about their generosity. It's interesting that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Is there a connection between the sounding of trumpets and the trumpet-shaped the trumpet boxes in the temple? Maybe. You know, is the sounding forth have something to do with the clanging of the money and the desire for people to hear? Maybe. I'm not going to go to the mat on that one, but certainly it is interesting that this idea of trumpet is, uh, is, could, be, could be connected with that. Now, it's important to understand, I think, that Jesus is not condemning rich people in this passage. It wasn't just scribes, and it wasn't just Pharisees that were putting money into the treasury. There were large numbers of people. There were other, other men would have been coming, other women would have been coming and, and putting their money in. So Jesus is not just watching the scribes. He's watching large numbers of rich people and poor people for that matter, coming and placing money into this, this box. Jesus said, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So Jesus was not condemning the rich here. He was not saying because you're giving out of your wealth, somehow this sacrifice is not acceptable to God. That's not what he's saying. Uh, he said you should have been doing this. You're doing the right thing by giving, but you should have been doing these other things as well. The Bible never condemn, condemns the rich. What the Bible does do is it commands the rich to share what they have. That's the command given to the rich in the New Testament. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, as for the rich in this present age, 
Charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation of the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So nowhere are the rich condemned. They're just commanded to be willing to share. The Colgate Palmolive Company is one of the oldest companies in America. It is about 200 years old. So it was established in the earlier part of the 19th century. It was started by a young man uh, named William Colgate. Surprise, surprise. He left home at 16 years of age to seek his fortune and everything that he owned in the world was tied in a bundle that he carried in his hand. But as he walked along on his way to the city, he met an old old neighbor, the captain of a canal boat. And the words the old man spoke to him on that day stayed with him for his entire life. He said, well, William, where are you going? I don't know. Father is too poor to keep me at home any longer and says I must make a living for myself now. William went on to say that he had no skills, he didn't know how to do anything except make soap and make candles. Well, said the old man, let me pray with you and give you a little advice. There in the pathway, the two of them, a teenager and an old man, knelt down and the man prayed earnestly for William. Then rising up, the boat captain said this, someone will soon be the leading soap maker in New York. It can be you as well as anyone. I hope it may. Be a good man. Give your heart to Christ. Give the Lord all that belongs to him of every dollar you earn. Make an honest soap. Give a full pound. And I am certain you will yet be a prosperous and rich man. So when William arrived in New York, he had trouble finding a job, but he followed the old man's advice. He dedicated his life to Christ. He joined a church and he began worshiping there. And the first thing he did with his first dollar was to give 10% of it to the Lord's work. From that point on, he considered considered 10 cents of every dollar as sacred to the Lord. In fact, he soon began giving 20% of his income to the Lord, and then he raised it to 30%, then to 40%, and then to 50%. And late in his life, he had become so successful that he devoted the whole of his yearly income, 100% of his income went to the Lord. Quite frankly, he had so much money at that time he didn't need an income. And so he just gave his full income to the Lord. It's quite a remarkable story. It's interesting, many of the great companies of today that have been around for 150 years were started by men of God. Kraft, for example, he gave 25% of his money to the Lord's work once his company was established and began to to prosper. J.D. Rockefeller Sr., I have tithed every dollar God has entrusted to me, and I want to say if I had not tithed the first dollar I made, I would not have tithed the first million dollars I made. So many of these companies were started by men who honored God, and I believe The prosperity even today of many of these companies is rooted in the faithfulness of these men when they first established them. Jesus does not condemn the wealthy. Paul does not condemn the wealthy. James does not condemn the wealthy. The Bible does not condemn the wealthy. But the Bible does teach the wealthy to share. It it, it condemns hoarding wealth. It condemns living for yourself and using all your resources for your own personal personal pleasure and comfort. It certainly condemns that. It condemns withholding money when you see somebody in need and you're in a position to help them. It condemns that. But it doesn't condemn the rich. People have got it all wrong today when they condemn the rich. Give to the work of the gospel. Don't keep it all for yourself. Make sure that you're honoring God with your wealth. Go back to your money on a regular basis and say, how can I honor God more in all that he has given to me? So whatever God has blessed you with, give and give to the glory of his name. Give in the name of Jesus Christ and give because you love him. Give because you love who he is and what he has done for you. Give sacrificially 
because God is worthy of that sacrifice. In the big scheme of things, he owns it all anyway, doesn't he? I remember one man years ago, I was speaking with him and he said, 90% of my money is mine and 10% is God's. Now, he said it like that, but he was a man of God, so I think he knew the truth of the matter. But the truth of the matter is that 100% of our money is God's. That he has entrusted it to our care, and it may be that you have de decided before God that you're going to carve out a certain percentage and give that to God, but, but it's all his, isn't it? And he's entrusted it to us for, uh, for the promotion of his kingdom and for the preservation of our life in this world. There's a clear contrast here in our text, though, drawn between the offering of the rich and that of the poor. And, and this poor widow in particular is drawn out as an example. So there's a number of things I want to say about this poor widow. The first thing I want us to consider is that she is an example of true godly sacrifice. True godly sacrifice. She gave two small copper coins, and these coins were called a lepton. And a lepton was the smallest denomination of money. It would be like, it'd be like I, our penny, which we've gotten rid of because it's, it's become so useless as a denomination of money. But it's the smallest denomination of money. In Luke chapter 12, the word is used in this context. And why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid your very last penny, or your very last lepton. In other words, you're not getting out of prison until the very smallest last piece of money that you have is actually given. You know, a man who... Who, who today, who might have lost all of his money, might say that I've lost every penny. It's to emphasize that he's got nothing now. I don't have two pennies to rub together. You know, the, the, it's the idea of the smallest denomination. This was a very small amount of money that this woman was offering. Now, I imagine that this woman made two lepta a day for her labor. We're not told what she did. Maybe she worked for a wealthy family. She went into their home looked after their children, maybe cleaned the house, cooked meals, did whatever it is they wanted her to do, probably spending you know, 10 hours, 11 hours a day working. And at the end of the day, maybe she worked in one of the laundry facilities in, uh, in, in her community. And, and, and working in a laundry facility at that time was not fun. Do you know that outside the front of laundry facilities in the ancient world, there were these large basins? Do you know what the basins were for? So that people could come and put their urine into the basins because that was used for the cleaning of the clothes. So here she's hauling human waste around all day, maybe, in the laundry facility and, and working hard in this smelly, awful environment. And then at the end of the day, she's given two leptas. And then she leaves and maybe she goes and I don't know what it could buy. Maybe a small container of goat's milk, a few vegetables, small bag of rice then she goes home and she eats half of it maybe drinks half the goat milk you know, maybe maybe she was able to get a little bit of bread bread's pretty cheap and and so, so she ate half her bread and, and then she saves the rest of it so the next day when she goes to work for 10 12 hours she has some food for the next day and then she gets paid two leptas at the end of that day and she goes and she does the same thing over and over again that's the kind of life she lived but then on one day the day that Jesus was at the temple, she didn't know Jesus was at the temple, but on the day that Jesus was at the temple, she decided, she said to herself, I'm going to take my day's wage. I'm going to take my two lepta, and I am going to give it to the work of God. I'm going to give it to the temple. I'm going to fast for a day. I'll have no bread, no goat's milk, no rice, no vegetables, no nothing, because she lived hand to mouth. And I'm going to give all of this to God as a sacrifice to him because, uh, because I love him. I'm going to deny myself on this day. She is an example. This is an example of true religion. Godly, self-sacrificing faith that delights in God. It is unseen, unnoticed, no trumpets, probably no sound, 
in the trumpet-shaped boxes when she dropped the two coins in, too small to make a sound, just an unknown woman giving her sacrifice to, to God. Now, some commentators do not interpret it in this way, and I think I should mention this. Some, some don't see this as an example of godly sacrifice. I was actually surprised at how many didn't see it this way. But as an example of a woman caught in works-based religion, and they would argue that she was actually attempting to buy her way into favor with God. She was giving her last two coins because she had been duped by the scribes and the Pharisees. She had embraced a works-based religion, and, and she was trying to earn her way into the kingdom by giving this money. One man actually, a quote what he said, in context, the widow's might event is primarily a comment about the results of the gross iniquity and self-serving deception and hypocrisy of the Jewish religious leaders, the time they preyed upon the vulnerable, even the poorest of the poor. And, and this is what struck me. He said, if you are a widow reading this, do not, N-O-T, uppercase, capital letter, do not do as the widow did, giving her last cent to ungodly deceivers who claim to speak for God. I was like, oh, I don't agree with that. It's the first response that I had when I read that. Another well-known conservative preacher said this, it is not an example of Christian giving. God doesn't expect you to give your last two cents and go home and die. And I thought, well, that's actually not what's happening here. She wasn't going to go home and die. She was going to go back to work the next day and get her wage and keep eating. This is what happens to a widow who is suckered by a religion of works. She was trying to buy with her last two cents her way into the kingdom because that is what she had been taught. I think that's fundamentally wrong. I don't think that's what's being said here at all. I think there are those who are trying to create some context that actually is, is, not, is not here. There's no question that the scribes abused widows. No question about that whatsoever. Jesus said that multiple times throughout the New Testament. He said in the previous text that we looked at last week. And there's no question in Mark chapter 13, we have this prediction of the destruction of the temple. And so immediately after the story of, of the widow, Jesus says this temple is going to be utterly destroyed. But this woman was not giving her last two cents to earn her way into heaven. She wasn't giving her money and then she was going to go home and die. There were many people associated with the temple who, who gave to the temple and served the temple at this time because they loved God. Even Jesus paid the temple tax. He certainly wasn't trying to earn God's favor when he paid the temple tax. What about Simeon? What about Simeon who hung out at the temple waiting for God to fulfill his promise to him that he would see the Messiah before he died? What about Anna, the old 83-year-old woman who for years went to the temple every single day worshiping God in the temple? There were multitudes of people associated with the temple who still understood who God was. And they were not trying to earn their way into heaven, but they were loving God and worshiping God and giving to the temple because they loved him. That's what this poor widow is. She's not trying to earn her way into heaven. She is a woman who loves God and she's seeking to honor God. Jesus didn't indicate here in any way whatsoever that this woman was trying to earn God's favor. In fact, he lifts up her sacrifice as an example, doesn't he? That she's given more than all those who've given out of their wealth. If she was giving money to earn her salvation, Jesus would not have held it up as a sacrifice that we should emulate in our own lives. He wouldn't have done that. He would have said, this woman has, has been deceived and she's trying to earn her way into heaven by giving. He didn't do that. He holds it up as an example of sacrificial living and sacrificial giving to God. Another interesting thing. As I said in chapter 13, we have, we have the teaching on the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and teaching on the second coming of Christ. The entire chapter focuses on that. It's interesting that the next interaction that Jesus has, so, so he, he, he sees the widow, talks about the widow who gives the two coins, does some teaching, some apocalyptic teaching, and then what's the next event in his life in chapter 14? 
The woman who comes in to his presence with an alabaster jar of perfume and breaks it open and anoints his feet. Now this alabaster jar of perfume was very, very expensive, was worth almost a year's wages. And she goes in and she, she offers this costly sacrifice to Jesus. And Jesus accepted it. He accepted it as a pure evidence, an expression of true faith, of true love for God. This woman loved Jesus. And she demonstrated her love for Jesus with this expensive, extravagant sacrifice of perfume that she poured on his feet. Nothing was too good for Jesus. I will give him my best. I will give him that which costs me the most. And so, so the teaching, this apocalyptic teaching is sandwiched between the poor widow who gave all she had to live on and this more rich woman who had given this very expensive perfume. These two events teach us a very important lesson. It is not how much we give to Jesus, but it is the sacrifice that we make. The woman who gave the, 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 the very expensive perfume, her sacrifice was no greater than the poor widow who gave two coins. In the sight of God, they were both beautiful, like sweet-smelling incense rising up before him. Both of them were acceptable to God. Both of them were worthy of the same eternal reward. And what about the boy who gave his lunch? Remember when the feeding of the, of the 5,000 and there was no food and Jesus told the disciples to go out and to buy food. They said, this will cost 200 denarii, which is about two-thirds of a, of a basic you know, soldier's wage for a year. You can't do it. And then a boy comes up and he's got his lunch, five barley loaves and two fish. And he, he offers the lunch to Jesus, gives the lunch to Jesus. And then Jesus takes his lunch and he multiplies it and feeds over 10,000 people. 5,000 men plus women and children, over 10,000 people in all likelihood were fed with this small lunch. Whenever you are tempted to think you have nothing to offer to Jesus, think of the widow's offering. Think of the widow's offering. And whenever you are tempted to think that the sacrifice is too extravagant, then think of the woman who offered a bottle of perfume worth a year's wages to Jesus. And whenever you may be tempted to think that you're too young to sacrifice something for Jesus, remember the boy who was willing to give up his lunch for Jesus. And then Jesus was able to take that lunch and multiply it to the glory of his name. Now it is very important to recognize as Christians that we are not making sacrifices to God in an attempt to win God's favor. That's not what it's about. We make sacrifices to God because we love God. We love God for who he is. And we love God for what he has done for us. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his unique son. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ... Though he was rich, he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And this is the love of God, where the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. When you sacrifice to God, you are saying, Lord, you have made the ultimate sacrifice for me. You have sent your one and only son into the world to lay down his life as a sacrifice for my sin. What other response can I have to you than to make sacrifices in return to express my love and my appreciation for all that it is you have done for me? We love God for who he is. We love him for his compassion. We love him for his purity. We love him for his holiness. We love him for his righteousness. We love him for his justice. And we love him for his wrath. We love God for his mercy and his kindness. We love God for all of his excellencies. We love him for who he is because he's worthy to be loved. And we love God for all that he's done for us. We love God as the creator of the world. 
We love God as the one who has provided for all of our physical needs. We, we love him for the rain that falls from the heavens. We love him for the food that grows out of the earth. We love him for the food on our tables. We love him because he's provided his son for us. We love God for who he is. We love him for what he's done. What sacrifice is too great to express our love for our God? What sacrifice is too great? There is no sacrifice that's too great. He's worthy of our sacrifice. He's worthy of our praise. Don't let anyone rob you of this beautiful example of sacrificial giving by suggesting that she was trying to earn her way into heaven. That's not what's happening here. She is an example of godly living, of godly sacrifice. And we should emulate this in our own lives. But it is a rebuke to the scribes. And it is rebuke to the Pharisees. There's no question about that. In the context, you do have that rebuke. She's an example of of true faith, a true lover of God. And uh, the scribes and the Pharisees were not. Me. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 5 is a very interesting passage related to this. Let me just read a bit of it to you. It's a a famous, well-known passage. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So John the Baptist prepares the way. The Lord comes to the temple. Jesus comes to the temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages. Isn't that interesting? That the one who doesn't pay the worker a fair wage is lumped in with the sorcerers, with the adulterers, and with the liars. This is how terrible it is in the eyes of God when somebody works and they're not paid a fair wage for the work that they do. And I would say that this widow was oppressed. She was probably a hired worker. worker. She was downtrodden. She was barely given enough money for her labor to even eat on a day-to-day basis. The scribes are men who devoured the houses of widows and kept them oppressed. And God is not pleased. God is not pleased when the worker is not paid a fair wage. You know, I love the movie Christmas Carol. We watch it every year at Christmas time. The black and white 1951 Alistair Sims Christmas Carol. The only true version. The (laughs) The only reliable one. The best one. There's never been a better one. There's been many, but 1951... Black and white, you know what black and white TV looks like, don't you? Yeah, black and white. It is definitely the best one. And it's just such a glorious story. And you know the story. Scrooge is a very wealthy man, but he's a very stingy man. You know, he goes in and he's eating at the restaurant and and he wants more bread. And they'd say he'd have to pay something for the bread. And he says, no more bread. He wouldn't even pay a, a penny to get another piece of bread. You know, he, he, had, he had Cratchit there working for him as his bookkeeper, paid him lower wages than most bookkeepers would have received, was too cheap to warm the room that he worked in, wouldn't buy the coal. You know, miserable life this man lived, couldn't provide well for his family because Scrooge was, well, a Scrooge. But I think my favorite scene in that movie is after his conversion. You know, he meets the three the three uh, ghosts or angels or whatever they are in the night, and he's converted, you know, and he wakes up and he realizes he's still alive and he's, he's converted and he's a changed man. And his housekeeper comes in with the breakfast and he's just happy and giddy. And they go into the other room and she's wondering what's wrong with him. And, and he just says, I have to stand on my head. I just have to stand on my head. And he goes over to a chair and he, he stands on his head. He's so filled with joy. And then she throws up her apron and starts screaming. And she's running down the stairs out of the house. Great, great scene. 
But then he runs and he, and he catches her. They're sitting on the, on the steps and he asks her, how much do I actually pay you? And uh, she had said, and well, first of all, he presses a guinea into her hand. And, uh, and she says, what for? To keep my mouth shut? And he says, no, 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 it's, it's a Christmas present. And she's flabbergasted, you know, that he would give her this. And then he asks her, how much, how much do I pay you a week? And she says, two shillings a week. And he says, it is forthwith raised to ten. And she asks him, are you sure you don't want to see a doctor? You know, she's, this, this, you're not the man that I've been working for all these years. You sure you don't want to be a doctor? And he assures her, no, 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 I don't want to see a doctor. And then she runs out of the house with great joy, you know, with a guinea in her hand and with this, this raise that's been given to her. That's what conversion does to a man. Here's a man as a self-centered pagan living for himself, just, just a, a money-grubbing, greedy man oppressing those who are under him, not paying a fair wage, demanding that people work for him with, 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 with less, for less than they deserve. But Jesus changes the heart, doesn't he? God changes the heart. And when the heart is changed, people begin to experience the guilt of how they treat other people. I mean, this was Zacchaeus' case, right? You know, the song Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. That's the value of simple songs for children. You remember them, right? And then when Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus, what happens? Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And I have defrauded, if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. Salvation brings somebody to the place where those who are, they're responsible for, they want to make sure they're properly cared for. They want to make sure they're properly paid if, they're, if, they're, if they own a business, if they're an employer. They want to make sure they treat people in the way that they should be treated. He repented of his oppression. He repented of his thievery. He repented of the way he treated people. God will judge those who oppress the hired worker. God will judge those who do not pay a fair wage. God will judge those who run international corporations who do not pay their people what they should be paid. No question about that. This was an oppressed woman, and she wasn't paid what she was worth. But it's interesting to me that she did not become bitter over her mistreatment. Now, I know that's not specifically stated in the text, but I would suggest to you that this was a woman who did not become bitter. It's easy to become bitter when you think that people are treating you in an unjust way. When you believe that you're not treated in the way that you should be treated, it's easy to become resentful towards that unjust situation. But this woman did not let injustice pervert her heart. She loved God. She loved the temple of God. She loved the things of God. And she gave what little she had for the extension of the kingdom of God. She is put forward as an example of what it means to serve God. What it means to live for God. What it means to sacrifice for God. Oppression is not an excuse for sin. Never. Abuse does not justify bitterness in your life. We all have difficult circumstances in our life. What really matters is how we respond to those difficult circumstances. We can give in to the temptation to become bitter and angry and resentful. Well, we can resist that temptation and accept the sovereign leading of God in our lives, even in the midst of the trouble and difficulty that we are experiencing. What an example of godliness that we have in this woman, an oppressed woman, a destitute woman, an abused woman, a neglected and forgotten woman, sacrificially and joyfully serving the living God. What an example that we have here for us. Example of total commitment. You know that Jesus is still sitting. He's still watching the treasury in the temple of God. 
The temple of God is the church of Jesus Christ made up of Jews and Gentiles. And Jesus is still sitting and he's still watching. He's still judging. He knows our hearts. He knows our motives. He knows what we give. He knows the sacrifice that we make or don't make. He sees all of these things. He's calculating those things. And those who give sacrificially and to the glory of God will be rewarded greatly in the kingdom of God. But those who give out of their wealth and make no sacrifice, no real sacrifice, their reward will not be as great as those who sacrifice a great deal. I'm not telling people how much to give in support of the Lord's work. That's between you and God. The New Testament is really clear. That's between you and God. But I would ask you, are you fully committed to the work of the Lord? Are you fully committed to the temple of God? Are you sacrificially giving to the work of God? Have you surrendered your life to God? 100% of your life. Do you know joy in the midst of trial? Have you resisted the temptation to become bitter in the face of adversity? You serve God faithfully and sacrificially under whatever circumstances you find yourself in. Do you make regular sacrifices to God, unusual sacrifices to God, great and extravagant sacrifices to God because you love him? Do you love him enough to take a look at your income yet again and to say, I'm not giving enough. I need to do more. I need to give to more Christian work. I want to be like this nameless widow. I want to be like her. And I hope you do too. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this example that you've given to us, this example of sacrifice, this example of love. We pray, Father, that we would be like this widow, that we would be like the the woman who gave the extravagant gift of perfume, that we would be like the young boy who's willing to give his lunch. We pray, Father, that we would be willing to give in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. We know that you that you love or desire a cheerful giver. We pray that we'd be cheerful in our giving, that we would not give with a a spirit of legalism or resentment, but that we would give with open hands and open hearts. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for our self-centeredness. Forgive us for trusting in what wealth we might have. Forgive us for fretting about the future and forgetting the promise that If we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, that all of these things will be given to us as well. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You will always provide for us and care for us until the day that you call us home. So, Father, forgive us for so often being like the rich man who wants to just scrape and save to have big barns when he retires and much to live on. Father, help us. Give us wisdom to know how to use our money for your glory and your honor. Help us, Father, to just demonstrate our love for you in so many different ways. Help us not to hold back, but to be extravagant in our sacrifices. We do pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, would anybody like to say something this morning? You have a testimony or a prayer request before we...